What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast interview. First off, thank you so much for tuning in, for checking out the show. Um, your support is massively, massively appreciated. The only reason that this show exists is because of all of your amazing support. So we truly appreciate your support. I truly appreciate your support. Make sure that you're sharing the show with as many people that you feel would benefit from the show. The goal is to always grow this show and go out there and have a big impact. Real quick though, before we jump into today's podcast, I want to plug our sponsors that make all of this possible. Our first sponsor is my personal 90-day mastery boot camp. This is my real estate agent mentorship training program. Um, it's a group training platform. This way it makes it extremely affordable for you. Inside this program, however, um, I am unpacking my entire playbook. I'm walking you through step by step everything that I do inside my real estate business, everything that I've done, everything I've learned um, in my 12 plus year career with selling over 5,000 homes, with selling over a billion dollars in real estate. Um, and I walk you through step by step exactly what I've done, how I built what I've built, um, and what I'm doing today to go out there and create the success. But don't mistake the low cost. Um, for low value. This is an insanely in-depth, step-by-step program um, where I'm walking you through, again, step-by-step on how I go out there. My team sells one to two homes every single day in today's market, continue to grow my business year after year, and how I've been able to exit from selling, exit from actually day-to-day involvement in my real estate team and create an epic, amazing real estate team that not only sustains but grows without my involvement. So whatever level that you're at, whether you're a brand new real estate agent, agent, you're an a individual high producing agent that wants to expand and create a team, or if you already have an amazing team or your broker owner that's looking to step up your internal training, looking to step up your systems, your processes, your tracking, make your business more predictable, this program is absolutely for anybody that's serious about leveling up inside their business. So check us out, www.90daymastery.com. Uh, make sure you use promo code Live Mastery, all one word, all together, all caps. That's going to get you the biggest discount on 90mastery.com. You're going to see tons of testimonials on their video testimonials, what's included in the program, the future dates of the program. I do several of these every single year, so make sure to check us out and make sure to jump inside that program ASAP. Uh, my next uh, uh, next sponsor that makes this uh, uh, show possible is perfectstormnow.com. If you're a real estate agent and you are looking for a lead generation machine website, backed by an insanely powerful CRM system that allows you to convert your leads to appointments at the highest possible level, manage all your tasks, make sure that you're effective and efficient as you possibly can be inside your business, transaction management component, all of that stuff. It is hands down by far the most effective and affordable real estate website and CRM program that exists out there in the industry. It's what I use to go out there and sell 650 plus homes every single year and the system is gnarly. If you're signing up for that program, Make sure to use promo code MASTERY, P-S-N, all caps, all one word, all together. That'll save you the $200 registration fee and get you a great discount. Um, our last sponsor is REO University. So I teamed up with a good buddy of mine who is the most knowledgeable dude, hands down, that I've ever met when it comes to REO properties. This guy used to work for the, the banks directly as an asset manager, um, and uh, he developed so many of the systems that you see that asset managers and asset management firms and banks used today. Um, this guy sold over 11,000 properties, foreclosure properties as an asset manager. And he and I teamed up um, with my experience of, of working with over 35 banks in my career, selling thousands of REOs plus his experience. We've created an, uh, uh, just an insane program. Again, um, REO University, the website is www.reo.com reo mastery university um it's a one-time payment for 997 or you can split that up into three monthly payments uh this is not a live boot camp like my 90 mastery boot camp this is something that you have access to instantaneously we we'll walk you through exactly how to go out there and get in with the banks um so how to get the business but then how to service that business at the highest level um how to go out there and complete bpos how to complete cash for keys how to how to make sure that you're insane at your valuations how to go out there and, and uh, make sure that 
your asset managers are winning and hitting their goals, key indicators you need to look for, and more. There's 22 in-depth, um, just amazing, powerful modules that will teach you how to become an REO machine inside your real estate business. Now, if you're like me, I don't want my business to ever be in a vulnerable position, right? I don't care if it's a good market, bad market. It doesn't mean that my business needs to be good or bad. My business can always be great. During a market crash, right, there's no such thing as if the market's going to crash. It's just a matter of when, right? But again, you don't need to put yourself in a vulnerable position. You can make sure that your real estate business is 100% recession proof um, and go out there and of course, generate business, do a ton of business regardless of what's happening in the marketplace. And this is exactly how you go out there and do it. And we walk you through step by step. So check us out, reomasteryuniversity.com. You can learn more about the program, hopefully register for the program, jump on in. Um, This price will not last long, right? We just created this product, rolled it out uh, several months ago, and uh, just getting in the hands of the consumer, and people are having a lot of amazing success. So again, check us out, reomasteryuniversity.com. All right, again, you guys, thank you so much for watching this show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure to share the show. Make sure to comment, uh, um, um, you know, like us on YouTube, leave some positive comments. We love hearing back from you guys um, and love getting your feedback. Keep kicking ass, and let's jump on in to today's interview. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast, where every single week we interview top entrepreneurs, top real estate agents, and those that are just out there dominating their space. These are people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves, for their families, as well as have a big impact on others. And you guys say we've got a very, very special guest on the show. This guy is just a mega successful entrepreneur, um, business owner, um, and just an overall badass. So our guest today, you guys, is the president and CEO of Renters Warehouse. I know those watching and listening, most of you on real estate, uh, uh, most of you have heard of Renters Warehouse. In my area, I'm in Phoenix, and, and you can't uh, go anywhere without seeing or hearing of Renters Warehouse. But Renters Warehouse, you guys, um, just to give you, put some perspective on here, um, now manages over $3 billion of, of residential real estate, um, over, uh, uh, represents over 14,000 investor clients, over 22,000 plus homes, and now is in over 25 states. You know, right, and just continues to expand and grow and explode. So, really stoked and honored to have uh, Kevin Orton on the show. Show my friend. Awesome, man. Well, quite the introduction. Holy cow! I appreciate that. And um, you know, it's an honor to be on. It's been uh, it's been fun watching your podcast and and listening to your guests. And uh, you know, just honored to uh, get to be a guest today. So, thanks so much. Yeah, and I'm excited, man. It's it's definitely an honor on my end as well, man. And and. You know, before we get into what you're doing, because I can't even fathom, and I don't know if when this journey started for you, if if you knew it was going to explode to this level, you know, right? You kind of sort of yeah. property manager for a minute. It's like, you know, I, I got to imagine, dude, it's just been like one hell of a ride. Some of it's been amazing. I'm sure some of it's been pretty damn insane too. Um, yeah. But before yeah. I get into that, dude, I'm, I'm, you, know, you start off as an airline pilot before you jump into this space. And, and I'm just really intrigued. you like, how, how did those, how did the dots connect? Like what led you to it? Yeah, so that's always an interesting part of my story. People love to hear about. And you know, before I did this full time, before I got into Renters Warehouse and real estate, uh, I was a corporate pilot. So I flew corporate jets. Um, and kind of how I got there really goes back to, to growing up. So born and raised in Minneapolis. I'm back here in Minneapolis uh, again now. So I'm based out of Minneapolis. But uh, after high school, actually went down to uh, your neck of the woods there in Phoenix. I went to Arizona State University. And but in high school. I got my pilot's license just for fun, uh, totally as a hobby, thought it'd be kind of cool. My dad did that as a hobby. My dad was a police officer by trade, but um, you know, flew for fun. So we did that, and uh, I went to school not intending to fly planes at all. Ended up getting roomed in my dorm with, um, with a guy that was in the flight program at ASU. I thought, geez, what better to do than fly around all day? That's, I guess that is, does sound fantastic. So I called my dad and said, you know what? I'm going to declare a major. I'm going to do aviation management. So at the time, there was two paths. You could be eventually get a degree to be a pilot, or you could get a business degree with an emphasis in the aviation space. I chose the latter, got a business degree with an emphasis in the aviation world, um, did a bunch of flying outside of the school uh, to get the uh, pilot part of it done. 
And right after I graduated, I got a great job flying uh, corporate jets for, for a private individual family. Did that for a while and, uh, you know, had about a six year career or so flying corporate jets. And during that time, I was always investing in real estate, working on real estate on the side and kind of getting into it. And uh, fortunately for me, started uh, the Renner's Warehouse in Phoenix about six months before I got laid off uh, from being a corporate pilot in the uh, recession and the real estate downturn. Uh, so it was just kind of good timing and a big passion of mine and, and really getting laid off and having just started the company. Well, that sounds tough. It certainly was, but it was, uh, you know, best thing ever happened. Blessing in disguise pushed me into this business full time and, uh, you know, never look back. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So, uh, so you're in, you're in Phoenix, Arizona during, you know, I, I, I got into real estate here in Phoenix. I'd moved to, to Phoenix from Michigan in 2004 and got into real estate, you know, 23 years old, 2005. Yeah. And yeah. You know, it was just insane what was happening. And then we all yeah. know what followed that. It was just, it was just a, a, a gnarly, gnarly crash. Um, then, so you're, you're in the thick of all of this. Um, is what led to Renner's Warehouse, you know, and I, I see this with a lot of property management firms because you were investing heavily. You know, did it kind of start as just a gig to manage your own properties? Yeah. Maybe as a side, you can manage others? Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, for me, it was um, kind of twofold. I, so I bought my first property when I was a uh, freshman in college, bought a duplex, lived in one unit, rented out the other. Uh, it was kind of my way of hopefully living, rent, living rent free through college, right? Turns out I was able to make a couple hundred bucks a month in cash flow too, which was fantastic. Got me hooked, right? So first property when I was uh, 18 years old, freshman at uh, ASU, and just kind of started adding properties with my dad and my brother. We, we had been buying properties together and ended up having more than I really wanted to, to manage, frankly, having a full-time job and everyone else was working and really just couldn't find a great property management company out there. Someone that was, you know, flexible and, and, and could do what we needed to have done and and I thought, geez, this could, be, uh, this could be a good business. I really like the recurring revenue that comes with it, right? Having clients paying you every month for something. And I thought a space that really could use some innovation and use some difference because frankly, especially in 2007, eight, when I was looking to get into the business, no one was really using any technology. It was all done on spreadsheets or pens and paper and there was no technology. And uh, you know, the real estate space was like that for a long time too, right? And, and property management is even farther behind traditional real estate when it comes to tech. So we thought we could come in and, and kind of put a, um, you know, get some young guys in the business instead of all the old gray hairs that were running around doing it and, uh, you know, do some innovation and, and do it better, right? Which is why a lot of entrepreneurs do what they do is we think we can do it better. And one thing led to another, uh, you know, here we are. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man. So, so that was 2009. Um, so it sounds though, like, you know, right out of the gate, I mean, you guys had a, a vision of, of taking this thing where you could scale it and go big. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. We wanted to make it scalable early on. Um, you know, I'm not the founder of the business. I joined the company, uh, about a year or so after it was founded. Um, our founder is no longer with us, but, uh, you know, it, um, he had a really grand vision for what he could do. Um, and we started franchising the business and as a, you know, a couple of broke entrepreneurs, that was the fastest way to, to grow a business without capital was to, to franchise and, and really teach people what we had learned in the couple of years that uh, we had been doing it. So we started franchising the business and that's really how we grew that scale. But as far as an individual office, I remember sitting around in the early days thinking, man, if we could get to 2000 homes, right, we'd be, we'd be made, we'd be, it'd be amazing. We'd be set. 2,000 properties, uh, you know, today we manage about 22,000 properties. So we've certainly surpassed that goal. You know, frankly, even before that, I remember just starting out like, man, if we get to a couple hundred, that'd be amazing, right? We're paying the bills, we're making some money, having fun doing that. So, you know, to your question earlier, did I have any idea what we could do with this business when we start? Absolutely not, right? Uh, you know, we wanted to grow a big business, but even a big business to us at the time was a tenth of the size we are today, right? And I think we're, we're only getting started now. So my eyes have been open to what we can do in this space with this business and really excited for what's ahead here the next couple of years. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So you, you know, I, I have to imagine, I mean, I've never, I've never flown an airplane, but I've flown in a lot of airplanes, you know, sure. and when you're seeing the dashboard and you're seeing what the pilots go through, I mean, dude, it is systems, operations, yeah, right. Like it is a very systematic process. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and do you think having that background 
You know, Cause I got to imagine as you're creating these efficiencies and, 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 you know, buttoning this down in a space that was just so far behind. You know, do you think that background really set you up to, to dial that stuff in the way that you guys have? Yeah, I think especially early on, right? Um, Cause trying to scale a business, uh, rapidly, right? We are ra- we've been a rapid growing business since, since nearly day one. Um, uh, when you can't afford a lot of people to come help you do it, or, you know, today I have uh, a whole group of uh, just extraordinary executives that have way more experience than I do in some of this stuff. And I lean on them heavily to help us continue to grow the business. But before you can hire to afford to hire people like that, you know, you're doing it with yourself and, and, and your partners and a few small group of people so it very much needs to be organized and process driven. And, um, you know, I think having that mindset that I grew up in since I was 15, 16 uh, in aviation with, you know, checklists and processes and, you know, checks and balances and all those things happening uh, certainly helped. Uh, it's, it still helps today. But like I said, certainly at the very beginning, too, as, as we were really starting to grow this thing. Yeah. Now, yeah. With, I, I know you talked about you know, early on deciding to, to franchise it because that was the quickest way to, to go out there and expand. Yeah. Um, you know, but was that, was that like, how early on was that, man? I mean, w- was that right out of the gate w- when you got involved or was that, you know, you know, kind of, did you guys cross close. that? Out? You know, that was one of the amazing things about um, uh, Brenton who started the business and uh, was, I joined him when he had maybe 150 homes that are management in Minneapolis. And I just opened Phoenix. We had 10 houses in Phoenix and 150 in Minnesota. And I'm with me. He's like, yeah, we're going to franchise this thing. I'm like, well, we're just, we just got started ourselves. Right. So that was very much an early vision of his. Um, I quickly got on board and, and to me, I was like, I'm going to be the biggest franchisee then. Right. I'm going to go out and open all sorts of different offices and, and really saw the opportunity to kind of grow, um, you know, a group inside of the group. And in 2015, uh, we sold a, a majority of the business to a private equity firm. And uh, so we're now private equity back, got some growth capital and, and change strategies from franchising to uh, opening corporate locations. Um, and so for the past two and a half years, that's what we've been doing is buying back a lot of those early franchises. Um, you know, we went, I think we had 20, 28 franchise locations in 2015. We have about 16 today. So we've, we've brought back several into the corporate fold. Um, and we've done, we've done some other third-party acquisitions and bought other companies and, and have just opened new markets, Greenfield Expansion, and, and really gone from and, and took what my vision was early on as a franchisee, which was owning a bunch of these stores and, and really having a group and trying to centralize some of the operations for my franchises to applying that to the entire company. So we now have uh, something like 25 corporate locations across the country, 42 total with our franchise network. Uh, but for our corporate locations, we continue to expand. We've centralized a lot of the back-end functions of property management. So think rent collection, maintenance, accounting, all those kind of call center type activities uh, back here in Minneapolis. We've got a huge team of people that do property management on properties all across the country. Uh, but real estate, as you know, and, and a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the watchers of the podcast here, the viewers know, real estate's local, right? So while we centralize a lot of that work that doesn't need to be done at a local level, one of the things I think we've done well is, has not forgot that, that local piece of this. And so every one of our markets has, you know, dedicated property managers, leasing agents, realtors, everybody that work directly for Renters Warehouse on the ground um, there as well. So we, we don't forget that kind of local touch. So what we're trying to do is, is keep that local touch field and experience the expertise that comes with being local, which is super important, um, but make it very, very efficient and systematized, going back to those systems again, um, by ev- anything and everything we can centralize that's repetitive we're able to do that. And that makes it efficient for us to kind of grow. This is a low margin business. Um, and so you got to find ways to, you know, increase those as you can. And, and once getting to scale, like we have, it's certainly been helpful. In that. Yeah, that's amazing, man. So then, you know, you, you, you talked about those early days, you know, when you didn't have the team and the people behind you, like you do today. Yeah. yeah. I mean, all the work had to get done, man, but, but you know, you didn't have, that, <clears throat> didn't have the funds to, to support it. And you know, everybody sees, you know, what Kevin's doing today, what Renner's Warehouse is doing today, but they don't realize all that blood, sweat, and tears and shit you had to yeah. you know, push through yeah. those days. Sure. Like, what, what, what were some of the biggest early on obstacles? Because, again, you're experiencing this massive growth, and I don't think most entrepreneurs, unless they've been through it, understand that growth pains can be worse than slow pains at times, right? And yeah. you know, what were some of those obstacles that, 
you know, just that almost broke you that you guys had to overcome during those times. Yeah, I think Juan was just, frankly, figuring it out, right? Um, because I had never been a professional property manager, never really worked for anyone as a professional property manager. And so we were just figuring it out as we went. I, I own investment property, so fortunately I knew it needed to be done. But it was, you know, all, you're wearing every hat, right? And that's what we talked to our franchisees about early on too, was as an entrepreneur and in this business especially, you're wearing a lot of hats, right? You're the IT guy trying to figure out how to install and run the software and you're the data entry person and the accountant and, you know, sometimes you're the repair guy going over and fixing things and you're leasing homes and you're rent collecting and doing all these things. And so uh, really being able to stay organized in that regard was huge. Um, so I think, you know, just, just figuring it out. Obviously, every entrepreneur goes to that when they're starting the business, trying to figure it out. Big obstacle. But I, I think, you know, second to that was it's – like a lot of things in this business, especially just tons of tasks need to be done, you know, like from rent collection to coordinating maintenance and repairs and, and getting accounting statements out and billing statements to owners and all these different things. And it's just a, the, without tech, technology and efficiencies, which we didn't really have a lot of in the early days, just a ton of hours, right? A ton of man hours. And, you know, so it's just grinding, right? It's, uh, it's, it's getting up early, going to bed late, grinding it out. I remember, uh, you know, once we got to several hundred homes, uh, maybe four or 500 homes, doing the monthly statement. Because we used to send paper checks to our clients with paper statements and it wasn't electronic and all that kind of stuff. So we had to mail every one of them. And uh, so I'd print all the statements in the office and I'd print the checks in the office and bring them home. And my wife and I were sitting there at the kitchen table folding statements. Uh, you know, when my kids got older, they were helping out and you know, it's a family effort. You grind through and, and you figure it out. So I think that's the biggest one is, is uh, you know, I think, I think a lot of people that, you know, look at starting a business, you know, I, I think this is why I've seen some entrepreneurs fail early on on some of their first ventures. I think starting a business is sweet. I can work my own hours. I can work less, right? I'm my own boss, all that kind of stuff. But the, you know, the, you know this, the, uh, the opposite's true. You're getting that business started, you know, early on, it seems like you have less freedom. You're working more, you're grinding it out, but you know, you, you got to do that. And we still have those times today being a, being a much bigger business. We're still not a huge business. Uh, but you know, we have, I don't know, 350 people or something like that work for us, but there's still those times where you got to grind. Right. And, uh, and you put in those long hours. So I think that's, that's probably the biggest takeaway. Yeah. Yeah. Love it, dude. So then, all right. So now you got 350, uh, uh, you know, staff or, or people on, on your team. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's different, you know, I I've heard of, of like the multiples of three, like, you know, like yeah, three, then, at, then when you get to 30, it breaks and then, you know, at 60, yeah. you know, yeah. these different levels of stuff just continues to, to break and what works with 25 is going to work with a hundred. And you know, what would have been, cause I can't even fathom leading a, a team of 350 people. You know, right? Make it keeping people accountable, have, having you know their scorecards and matrix set up, and yeah. what have been some of those internal leadership, you know, a, a challenge that you've had to overcome, and you know, how have you guys been able to? Because again, you guys such great people, efficient processes, you get a great result on a large scale, you know, with a relatively small team, if yeah. you put it in the grand scheme of things. Right. You know, um, I think managing a big group of people. Uh, the trick comes down to hiring the right people, right? It sounds obvious, but it's so much, it's so important. It's even more important than I, you know, ever thought, especially as you're going through this massive growth phase where you're hiring tons and tons of people. Um, you know, there's times where we're hiring 25 people a month, right? Um, and so screening through that and, and taking your time, we've, we've certainly made the mistakes of hiring too fast, right? Because it hurts. We need someone. Our team's getting burned out. They're working long hours. Uh, the work's not getting done. Got to get someone in, and and you know, it's not quite like you're hiring the first person that walks in the door. Uh, you know, fill the seat, but it almost feels like that sometimes, and that ends up causing way more pain down the road. So we've learned to, no matter how bad the need is, one, we try and hire ahead of need, right? And and as over time, I think you get better at anticipating what those needs are and when you need to hire. Um, we're at a, we're at a place today where we're constantly recruiting and constantly consistently hiring. Um, uh, because we can, but, you know, back when we were, we were being a little more on, off and selective about that, trying to hire ahead of need can be challenging though, uh, as well, because sometimes you can't afford to do that. So we used to have the slogan of hire when it hurts, right? And that's when you know you're, you're kind of at your maximum efficiency level, hire when it hurts. And 
we wait till it hurts. And then sometimes you got to try and try and move fast, but we learned to really slow down, uh, do multiple interviews with people, have multiple people involved in the interview process. And, um, you know, a lot of people say it right hire for character and, and and train for skills and that kind of stuff right and really trying to learn those questions to drill and understand what people are about why they want to be with the business and that kind of thing but i think hiring slow um and frankly firing fast right is um is is, is super important as you grow a scale of the team because it can really get away from you quick you know there's all that you talked about you have scorecards you have metrics in place you have all these different things but if you don't have the right people none of that crap matters anyway and so it really comes down to the people and sure they got the right people in the organization from, you know, from bottom to top, top to bottom. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it, dude. I mean, I mean, if you look at, you know, like Apple, right. The, the wealthiest company that's ever existed in recorded history. And my, my stepdad works for Apple. He's um, right. up in, uh, you know, up in uh, private Oregon. He's head of all the climate control uh, where Siri is located. Okay. And dude, I mean, he went through, it was like, it was like two years of interview processes and, you know, to get that position, but right. you know, it's, it's, you know, they're, they're, they're the king of, like you just said, man, hire slow, fire fast. Right. Yeah, so, yeah absolutely. Yep. So love it, dude. So then it, it, I, I'm, I'm interested, man. in like, what led you to writing the book, you know, right? Like yeah. you know, one of our, one of our mutual friends, Darren Hardy, like, okay, I see, I see Darren Hardy writing a book, but in your space, you know, right. For a property manager, it's, it's not something that you see a lot of yeah. you know, sort of like selling coaching to other property managers. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, so, uh, just over a year ago, we've had it out for a year. The book's been, uh, been a big hit for us and, and really helpful. But, uh, so I wrote a book, uh, uh, for the viewers, rent to state revolution. And it really talks about why, um, why now is the time to get into this space, right? Um, why, why the, the, the economy is right. Why the, the, the macroeconomics makes sense to buy more residential rental properties, you know? Um, so we talk about that whole macro picture, but then we break it down and get basic with it on, you know, how to buy your property, what to look for in the property, how to finance the property, all the different financing options that are out there. And then frankly, big section, the third section is how to, how to operate the property. So we're pulling back the curtain a little bit, let people in on the secrets of what we do to be successful at Renters Warehouse so that those people who do want to take on the challenge of managing a home themselves, it's kind of like a little workbook for that. We obviously recommend third party management in there as well, but that's because it's all about how do you grow a portfolio for long-term wealth and financial freedom, right? So uh, that kind of goes back to why I wrote the book is I'm so passionate about this space, right? Um, just like you're passionate about real estate and helping people and coaching and all that stuff. This space for me, I think can solve a massive problem for America, which is uh, frankly, uh, Americans are woefully unprepared for retirement today, right? We hear about it all the time. We hear about it on the news. We hear about it in different groups we're at, but what are we doing about it? Not a lot, frankly, right? And um, Pensions are all but gone unless you work for the government and you're one of those lucky folks that's going to have a pension after some time. Uh, and the 401ks and the independent retirement accounts that were uh, set up to really take place of, of the pension funds, no one's saving and they're not working. And so there's just crazy stats out there talking about how little people have said 40% of millennials have, have saved, you know, zero dollars for retirement. Um, and something, you know, staggering, like 60% plus of, of just general, the general American population has less than $50,000 saved retirement. I don't remember the exact stats, but they're crazy, right? Um, and I think this is a tool that helps change that, the, the single family rental space. Because what's unique about this asset class is ordinary Americans can buy into this. And if you do it early enough in life and, and you hang on to it, you can build a great portfolio that's going to help fund you in the later years. So you're going to be able to build that long-term wealth creation, financial freedom, build a legacy for your family if you want a lot of different reasons. And it's so unique, the different tools you can do to, to purchase the properties and the way you can leverage yourself differently than any other asset out there, I think is remarkable. And so we wanted to go talk to people about that. We wanted to talk to people about the power uh, that this, this, this can have. I mean, if you think about it, over time, uh, you, you buy one house when you're 25, right, uh, as an investment. You keep it for 30 years. When you're 55 years old, it's paid off. And oh, by the way, you get the cash flow coming every month. But better than just the cash flow is you have an underlying asset value. So essentially, it's like an annuity, except for the fact that you can actually sell that annuity if you need to. And, and imagine if you buy two or three or four, right, over time. And so that's the principles we tried to teach through the book. That's the principles we, you know, we don't just manage properties at Renters Warehouse. We're really trying to be advisors to our clients. 
um, and advised me on how to grow a portfolio, how to build a portfolio and go from one to two and two to three and uh, what to do over the long run. And it's not exciting. It's not sexy. It's not a get rich quick scheme, right? I call it get rich slow, but you know, it works. And um, so we get really excited about it. That's why we wrote the book. Uh, and, and we give it out to our clients and, and prospective clients and people who want to, you know, get involved or it's, of course, it's for sale on, on Amazon as well. But we're just teaching people about the space, how to get into it, and I think how to solve a problem of, uh, of that retirement insecurity we have in the United States. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's badass, dude. And those that are watching, listening, you know, um, uh, our audience is 90 plus percent uh, real estate agents that are out there representing yeah. their clients. And if we look at you know, right now, according to National Association of Realtors, that the biggest purchasers right now are millennials, right? The, the, you know, the, the average purchaser price right now or the average age is 33, but you're talking, you know, what is it? 20 to 37, if you will, is the biggest, right. the, the biggest uh, group that, that's purchasing. Yeah, and if us as real estate agents read your book and just educate them, it's just like, dude, just budget a little bit, buy a little bit less than, than you know, than you can afford. Right. Budget smart, keep that house forever. I, I've never had a conversation with anybody that's, let's just say 85 or, you know, in their later years yeah. that, that would not have uh, or, or doesn't regret not figuring out a way to hold on to every piece of real estate they own. Right, right. You know, and that's what I've done growing up is um, I think every house but one house I've ever owned or lived in, my family is we've kept as a rental. That's how I built my rental portfolio. And the last house I moved out of, I sold only because I'm living right across the street from it. I literally moved across the street and I didn't really want to deal with owning my rental right across the street for myself. So that was the only reason why, but, that, but that's what I did. And you know, what's so unique about this space, and this is great for all the, the realtors watching is you're talking to your clients about this. You know, if you're a realtor, the best type of client to have as an investor is going to come be a repeat buyer, right? And a repeat buyer and seller and buy more homes. And so we have to educate people about this. And uh, so, you know, we have a lot of realtors buy the books from us, give out to their clients and, and work through it that way. But I think one of the unique pieces that I just love about this is how you can actually leverage an investment, right? As ordinary Americans, you and me, everybody watching, there's no investment out there that we can go and buy, that we can borrow money to buy, ex except for this, right? I mean, imagine going into your banker today and trying to buy some of your stepfather's company stock, Apple, right? Go into your bank and say, I'm going to borrow 100 grand from you and I'm going to buy some Apple stock. They're going to laugh you out of the bank. Might even throw you out. You go back 20 minutes later and say, okay, I want to borrow 100K to invest in my portfolio. Okay, they're not going to give it to you. Ask for 100K to buy a piece of real estate, they'll do the deal on the spot, right? And so now you, as an ordinary American, you can borrow someone else's money to buy your investment, put someone in that investment that pays the borrowed money back for you. I mean, talk about leverage, right? Talk about use, using other people's money. It's amazing. And there's no other tool like it. And so you, you, if you have, 50K set aside to invest in something, you can actually buy a couple of somethings because you can leverage that money, right? And, and you can put some leverage on it. Um, and so I'll caveat that, that do it smart, right? I'm a big 30 year fixed mortgage guy in rental properties. Well, too many people got in trouble because they're trying to be tricky with what they're doing. through. This is meant to be held for a long time, get a fixed rate on it, get that 30 year conventional or a 15 year conventional if you want to pay it off sooner. Because it's not a get rich quick thing, but it's amazing how we can leverage that money and not only that, have someone else pay the money back for us. Not only that, put some money in our pocket at the same time. Oh, and by the way, we're going to pay less taxes because we have a bunch of write-offs as a real estate investor, right? So it's just, there's so many about it, but I think too many people are scared of it because it sounds complicated. Being a real estate investor is a big deal, right? They think, they hear that, that's for Warren Buffett or, you know, uh, Donald Trump or whatever real estate investor you know, um, but it's not for me ordinary American sink. And that's what we put the book out to say is it absolutely can be. You can be a real estate investor with one home and make it easy by outsourcing everything. Have the right real estate partner, have the right realtor, have the right you know, lending partner and have the right property manager. And it can be as easy as, as owning a lot of other investments, but a lot more lucrative over the long term. So I apologize for the long answers. You can tell I get super excited about this stuff, man. Yeah, no, I, I love it, man. And if we, if we look at, you know, none of us have a crystal ball, but if, if you just look at population growth and, and the, the amount of new builds being built, you know, yeah. they're, they're not building at a fast enough rate to sustain the population growth, right? right? So, I mean, at some point here in the next, who knows, 10, 20, 30 years, we're going to have a massive, massive shortage 
of homes for people to purchase. Their only option is going to be to go into rentals. Yeah, right. So the more that you can yeah. stack up with these, right. you know, right? I mean, you're 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 not going to regret it, especially, you know, um, now that the population is growing again, people have more and more kids. It's just going to become more and more in demand. Yeah, you know, I get the question a lot of is is now really still the right time to buy? Because everyone was excited about buying. 10 years ago in the downturn, right? When you could buy houses cheap and they're going to get the housing price appreciation with them and, and, and sell them or whatnot. And I think the biggest um, thing I like to look at there are the institutional folks, yeah. right? So yeah. if you're in real estate, you know of Invitation Homes and Blackstone and all the homes they bought. They're the largest homeowner in the country now, merged with Colony. They have, what, 85,000 single family homes across the country. Huge amount. Um, and then there's a lot of smaller funds out there as well, some of which we work with. But they're still buying today, right? I'm not nearly as smart as the guys that run those businesses and those funds and not nearly as smart on the economy and the housing market and all these different things as they are. But sure, they may have bought at the downturn and their original play was more of a, you know, let's buy these for four or five, six years and sell them. But they've found that they can really have a good, nice business with this. And they found that they can make nice yield and, and cash flow off these properties and that it still works for them today. So if the largest institutions are out still investing in this space today and plan to hold for a long time, um, even with the market, you know, significantly appreciated since when they first bought, I think that that's good sign that, uh, you know, this is something that's a lot around for the long term to, to, to really be a great field for, for all of us to be playing in. Yeah. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more, man. So then, um, all right. So, so with us that are real estate agents, you know, and, and again, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, you can't go anywhere without hearing about you guys in Phoenix, yeah. Arizona. And, and when you break it down, you know, what, what I love about you guys is um, because your, your systems and process and you've got this so dialed into an art or to a science. Yeah. Right. Um, it's amazing service. It's like, it's great to work with you guys as a real estate agent. It's great for our clients. It's amazing for our clients compared to, 99.9% .9 of every other property management firm I've ever worked with and it <laughs> makes it where it's more affordable, you know, right? Because of the volume and the efficiencies that you have where right. you know, it's, it's, it's very affordable. It's an amazing experience for the agent, amazing experience for the client. And if I'm referring a client to a property manager and the property manager sucks, I'm not getting a repeat transaction out of that client, yeah, right? So it's, it's that reflection. Yeah. So, you know, it's critical for real estate agents to be teamed up with, you know, an amazing company like yours. And, for those that watch and listen, man, like, like what do they need to know? And, and what is the best way to see if you're in the area, if they have clients they want to refer you to, how do we go about that? Yeah, look, and I appreciate uh, all the, all the wonderful remarks. I think what's unique about us at Renner's Warehouse is we actually, we don't do any buying and selling, right? There's a ton of property management firms out there that do both, right? You kind of mentioned at the very beginning, a lot of people get into property management because they have some of their own properties. And they do it by default and they just kind of fall into it. And, and frankly, a lot of people get the property management because they're having a hard time making it as a realtor or the, or the economy's tough. So that's not selling homes. So they start managing houses to make some income. And they don't really want to do it. It's a tough business, but they do it. Um, and really they want to do it to be able to get some sales. And so oftentimes there's this really tough notion, um, misunderstanding from realtors that, hey, if I'm going to refer my business out, you know, to, to renter's warehouse that I got to worry about if I'm going to get it back to do that next sale, right. To get that repeat client. And one of the things we did early on was, so we're not going to buy and sell homes. And we do that for a couple of reasons. One, we want to be laser focused on what we do and what we do best, which is leasing homes and managing them on a monthly basis. That's it, right. We can always improve that service. Let's do that. There's a ton of that business out there for us to go after. Let's go after that. But really also secondarily to that or almost as equally important was we wanted to create huge referral partnerships with all the realtors out there and be able to work together on that and take down all the barriers that make people worried about working with property management companies like, Hey, you guys buy and sell and my client's just going to sell their home or buy their next home with you kind of thing. So we don't do that. No threat to, to real estate agents when you're referring clients to us because we're going to send them back to you. If they have a question about buying another house, they want to sell their current house. We tag them with every realtor that, that refers us property uh, we, we tag that property with them so we can send it back if it ever, you know, comes up for that point. We also refer our clients to, you know, our big realtor referral partners who send us a lot of business. We're referring clients that aren't associated with a particular realtor back to those guys as well. So it's a nice two-way relationship is my point there. And on top of that, we, we pay pretty nice referral fees for, for doors that are coming in. So 
we'll pay upwards of 500 bucks for uh, clients that, that sign up for our management program. If it's someone who just does leasing, that's 250 bucks. So you can put a little extra money in your pocket and have this relationship. Uh, but ultimately, we like to make it look like, uh, you know, it's, it's a partnership. And we want to send some deals back and forth with each other and, uh, and do good business that way. So if you want to learn more about that, of course, uh, anyone, anyone watching, just renterswhereelse.com uh, is our website. Uh, you can find our markets there again we're in 42 markets so we're, we're uh you know if we're not in your market today hopefully give me a year or so and we'll be there but um you can look there to learn more about it you can go to our referrals page on our website um to to sign up to learn more to get more information or to start referring clients uh but hey we love working with the real estate community um you know we try and be kind of the opposite of a lot of the property management companies out there that have a uh you know, a, a tough relationship with realtors. And we know we got to make you guys look good uh, to your clients happy. So just know that's always top of mind for us. And um, uh, just so important. Yeah. Yeah. Love it, man. Um, so, you know, 2009, couple hundred properties, you know, right? Like you don't know where this thing is. I mean, I'm sure you got, you know, you're thinking big, but you don't know exactly where this is going to go. But now that yeah. you achieve this insane amounts of success, this growth that you have, you know, like, where do you see this, you know, going? Like, what did, what is your personal vision for the company? Boy, um, you know, it's big. I think, um, well, again, I think one of the things that's benefited us growing the company is we've tried to stay focused, right? Um, you know, a lot of people that watch your podcast are entrepreneurs. You've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs. And the problem with being an entrepreneur is there's good ideas everywhere, right? And, and there truly are. And in fact, I have a good idea folder. Like I have a good idea, write it down, put it in a folder because I, I don't want to get distracted by it. When I have time for a good idea, we go back to the folder, right? You don't want to forget about it. So one of my biggest jobs here now is keeping us on track, right? And uh, we're at a point where we've got tons of cool little add-on business opportunities, vertical integrations, things we could do. Um, but we, I keep us focused and it's like, let's improve our, our core service offerings, right? Let's make leasing even better. Let's rent houses even faster. Let's rent them for more money to better tenants as quick as possible. Uh, let's make our property management. Let's, let's, let's increase the speed of which we return our clients' phone calls and, and can respond to maintenance requests and drive maintenance pricing even down so our clients can make more money. And how are we gonna take better care of our tenants? For me, it's a mindset of improvement, continual improvement, how are we gonna do that? Um, you know, so as we talk about growing the company where we're gonna go, for us, it's more of the same. We're going to do more of the same, but my vision for this is I believe we're going to be a property management company that manages a couple hundred thousand properties here inside the next, I don't know, 10 years. Um, and, you know, we're the largest third party property manager of single family homes today. Uh, but at the end of the day, there's about 22 million single family homes rent across the country. 22 million. So that's one to four units. So, you know, government for, for lending purposes considers SFR four units or below. So one to four unit dwellings. 22 million units. Today, I manage 22,000. So I could 10x the size of this company and still have less than 1% market share. It's amazing, right? And so we really think we can just, we're going to storm ahead and we, we want to build something big and beautiful. Um, and, you know, what happens for that is all of our clients gain that advantage because what's happening today and where I really think this ultimately goes is we can, we can create great scale. And all of a sudden, you know, the quote unquote little guy, who owns one home can have the same advantage as invitation homes who owns 85,000 homes. And what I mean by advantage is better volume maintenance pricing, volume pricing on, on appliances. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, the marketing power of getting those homes rented, all the things that you get with scale, we can deliver to our clients. Now we're already starting to be able to do that because we have 22,000. We've got some serious scale, but we want to be able to drive scale in every region we're in. So we can take full advantage of that. And I think that's going to be game changing and transformational um, for, for mom and pop real estate investors out there saying, you know what? Um, not only is this an asset class that I can play on a level, level playing field with, with, a, with an institution, Blackstone. In fact, I probably have an advantage and a leg up in some cases because I'm going to buy likely in markets that I know and live. So I know more about it than the guy in New York looking to figure out where to buy a property. But now... I can join, join a portfolio like Renner's Warehouse, have them manage my property, and I'm gonna get all the same benefits of scale. And I think that's incredible, right? I talk about how excited I get uh, trying to encourage people to buy into this asset class and, and change their financial future by doing it. 
But now imagine if we can gain so much scale that we can offer everything that an institution has or a large portfolio owner has to someone who has one house. Game changer. The same analytics, the same data, the same ability to say, hey, maybe we should sell this home and buy you this different house over here. And look at it less like a property manager and more like a you know a financial advisor, right? We're, we're helping you manage a portfolio or something. And uh, you know, take that data down to the little guy um, and, and give them the same data ability, but also take that buying power and that power of scale down to the, down to the little person. So, you know, that that's what I see doing. That's what we're working to make is is a, is a fantastic client experience, uh, a fantastic experience for our residents and our tenants that are staying in our homes, and build that value up. And at the same token, you know, build massive massive scale uh, that all of our clients win when we do that. Yeah, that's, it's amazing, man, because it's, and I know you have many, many more of these conversations uh, uh, than I do, but when I'm talking to clients, I'm advising them to, hey, hold on to that piece of real estate, right? Like, right. you know, and they're looking at me like I'm crazy because I'm, <laughs> I'm talking to them out of listing their house with me, but right. you know, I mean, the, the number one concern or, or, or scare that most people have that I'm always dealing with, because they're in a position where they can, um, but is the headaches, the unknowns. You know, um, and it can be an extremely dangerous space if you don't know what you're doing and you don't right. deal with the right property manager. So I, yeah. I understand why those thoughts are there, but this allows them to, like you said, an affordable way to eliminate all of that and have all at their disposal. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, obviously, I talk to a lot of people about investment real estate, and they always ask me, like, oh, what's the crazy horror story of, you know, a tenant doing damage to a house or, you know, what's the worst thing that happened or, you know, don't, don't houses get tore up a lot or all those kind of things. And I managed a lot of houses. And let me tell you what, that is, those types of situations are super rare, right? Uh, if we look at how much, how many homes have damage from a resident when they move out that exceed the security deposit, uh, you know, single digit, digit percentages, very low. Um, and so I always like to tell the story of horror stories are generally just that they're stories, right? Um, uh, in Minneapolis, it's finally summer. We got some great weather, so we're getting after it up here, but um, we, we, Minnesota thing in the summer is go outside, hang out with your neighbors, your, your friends, your buddies, the kids have a bonfire and, and tell stories, right? Drink some beers. And, and, and I think these are one of those bonfire story moments. Like no one likes to sit around with their buddies and say, you know, I know a guy who owns a rental property and his tenant pays on time every month. Like, that's not a good story. <laughs> the good story is like, I know a guy whose cousin, sister's mom's brother owns a property and like this whole crazy thing happened to it. Right. Um, and, and the house burned down and all the likes. And, and those are the stories people like to tell. So they get repeated, they get exaggerated, they get made up. And, and look, sometimes it happens, right? Uh, but that's, the, that's, a, that's a rare, rare, rare situation where it's, it's really that much problem that's occurred. Uh, because it, ultimately, most people in society, most people in the world, they're, they're good people, right? And they're going to take care of their property. And uh, um, so I always like to, to give that example to people of oftentimes those horror stories are just that they're stories, right? But it does start, again, we, we talked about people being so important for the business and our employees and having great people in our business, but being successful in investing in single family homes or investing in real estate is also about the people and making sure you're putting the right people in your home in the first place. And so that's where our process starts. Once a client signs up with us and we choose how much we're going to rent their home for with them, it starts with the people. And we do tons and tons of marketing and advertising to drive tons of tenants to our listings. So we have got plenty to look through, plenty to select. So our clients aren't feeling pressure to take the first application because they know there might be another one coming in tomorrow or the next day. And, uh, you know, they're not worried about sitting vacant for two more months. So they're going to take this first application that comes in. And so it's all about the screening, doing the right background checks, the right interviews with the tenant, the right, you know, reference calls and all that kind of stuff. And, and frankly, it's kind of self-centered to do this because if we put the right person in, it makes our job way easier, right? And, and we're making more money. Um, and so it, it goes back to that people thing. And that's where we spend so much of our time with our agents on the ground is, is ensuring we're selecting the right tenants for the assets and, and the properties. Uh, and then everything else goes really well after that. Yeah. You know, awesome, man. So this is kind of switching gears here, but okay. you know, um, I, I, I heard <laughs> It was from like Rob, uh, Rob Deerdeck on the new Thinking Grow Rich documentary that was released. And, yeah. um, you know, this was like, like six months ago. And he said during that, that documentary, he's like, you know, the, the, if you were to draw a line in the sand of the one defining thing between those that actually achieve success compared to those that say they want it but never achieve it, which is 
those that never achieve success obsess over the things that success brings them, the houses, the cars, you know, the clothes, the vacations. Um, and that's all they obsess over, right? Compared to those that actually truly achieve the success, obsess yeah. over the little things that lead to them having success. Yeah, right. And, and when I'm like asking about your clarity, like where you want to go, it wasn't X amount of homes, valuations. It was like, hey, we want to answer the freaking phone faster. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, like yeah. I mean, I, 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 it doesn't surprise me that you, you had those responses. And it yeah. speaks to how successful you are, but I wasn't quite expecting that either, man. And it yeah. just it made me instantaneously think of that quote of, like, dude, like, that is the power. you like, you are obsessing over, you know, the things that lead to that at a high level, man. And it's, it's, it's pretty fucking mind blowing, dude. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm a big believer in that stuff. Um, that it's the small things that matter. Right. I, I don't remember if, if it was before we started the podcast or even during the podcast, we mentioned Darren Hardy, but I'm, I'm a big fan of Darren Hardy. And I think to oversimplify things, life, life and success really comes down to one of his, his philosophies of a compound effect, right? It's the small things done well over time consistently that breeds big change right and big success and all kind of stuff and and that's that's where it starts with us right we just talked about it. it's about for us creating more success and more value for myself and our shareholders is answering the phone just 30 seconds faster right or, or 10 seconds faster or responding to someone instead of our average response time being six hours make it five hours and 47 minutes whatever it is uh you know drilling down on those things every it builds on that, right? Um, and it, it goes back to to the small things. To make a huge real estate investment successful starts with the tenant, right? And so th those are the things, and I'm a huge believer in that. I think that's that's ingrained in me. I actually, uh, I laughed, you kind of point that out because I wasn't thinking about that, obviously, when, when we were talking about that. But, um, you know, I think that's so key. Uh, people talk to me about success and what, what should I do to be successful? And oftentimes it's such, it's such simple tasks that need to get done and, and you break it down and I can give you some philosophical debate on, on what some individual needs to do to, to make themselves hugely successful. But it all comes down to, frankly, half the time it comes down to taking care of themselves, right? You need to, you want to be successful. You got to start eating better food and working out. And from there, everything else is going to fall in place, right? Uh, cause, cause essentially at the end of the day, you're, 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 you are your own star player and you got to take care of you to kind of get to, the, to that next level of success. Yeah. No, I love it, man. So I, I know we're getting long on time and your time's really valuable, but uh, j just, um, you know, one more main question for you. So yeah. knowing everything that you know now today, you know, right, all, all, all these experiences that you've had, everything that you've went through, all the growing pains, learning pains, lessons that you've learned, and, and again, the success that you had, if Kevin today could go back to the Kevin in 2009 when this journey first started yeah. and give yourself two pieces of advice that you feel would just a fast forward this trajectory to success, knowing everything you know now, what would that look like? Hmm. Man, that's a deep question. That's a big question. But I think uh, absolutely the number one piece of advice uh, after this that I've learned from this that I wish I could go back and tell 2009, Kevin, is to bookend your days. Um, I started bookending my days a couple of years ago. And what that means is, is having that morning routine, that morning ritual, and that evening routine and that evening ritual um, you can control that time. You can organize your day, get your shit done the morning and night, whatever happens in between, maybe it doesn't matter, but you can be so productive by doing that. So bookending the days is, is massively, uh, important. And I think, uh, a huge piece of advice I'd give myself, um, back then. And then I think, um, number two would, um, number two would, Man, I don't know what the second piece of advice I give. That's a tough question. I think, I think ultimately, I hear, here's probably what it is. If, if there's any regret I have, it's that I didn't early enough start designing my tools, processes, and business systems for scale, right? Um, it, it's designing something to be scalable wasn't important because I didn't know where we were going to go. But I think if you design a process to be scalable, it generally ends up being one of the most efficient processes you can have in the first place. And so far too many of us, or certainly for me, when we were starting the business was, hey, we need to have a process for that. Like just throw something together and whatever it is, is what it is. 
but really deep diving in that and understanding it's the best process, right? Um, and constantly refining them rather than just kind of band-aiding them, I think is big. And so, you know, I've been, been a student of, of scale now for a decade, really trying to understand how to continue to scale a business. And looking back, I think we could have done a lot of things different early on in that, but I think that might only be able to come with, with having the experience and the and ability to look back and seeing that. So I'm not sure if that'd be good advice for myself or not then, but uh, certainly just really how you organize your own life and those, those daily bookends, you know, is probably one of the most impactful, powerful things I've done um, just recently here in the past, uh, you know, a couple of years. Yeah. That's powerful stuff, man. Out of curiosity with that book ending the day, how, I mean, like for, for me, when I, when I try to book in the day, the morning is, is easy, but man, it's tough at night to shut it down. And, 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 you know, and I mean, how, how long did it take or, or was it a struggle for you to kind of get in that routine? Super huge struggle. Um, and there's been times since I got on the routine, I've fallen off the routine and got back on the routine or is it, and I track it. It's really something I track, um, on a weekly basis of, you know, how many mornings did I do my morning routine? How many evenings did I do my evening routine? You know, and I try to get at least five kind of weekday program weekend. I'm a little more flexible and there's weeks where I don't get them all, but I can tell the difference in my productivity on the days. That's why it's so impactful for me is, is I do watch it. I do track it and, and I can actually literally tell the difference when those things happen. And so that once you do that and you can see that difference, I think it's so much easier to stay on the program because you see the results, right? Early on, it's just kind of this thing you're doing. But once you can feel and see the difference, it makes it really, you know, it gives you some of that motivation. But without the motivation, you just have to have the discipline to do it. And um, it's hard. It was very hard. Uh, it's still hard. It's not easy oftentimes because you get home, long day in the office, go hang out with the family, do some of the kids' activities, come home. And the last thing I really want to do is sit down and kind of reflect on the day and organize my thoughts and get ready for tomorrow. You know, you just kind of want to go to bed. So um, it, uh, it can be challenging, but uh, it's very, very impactful. And uh, it's been a fantastic. Yeah, awesome, man. Love it. Um, and those that are watching, listen, I know I end every podcast with this, but information without implementation uh, is truly the start of delusion. Information isn't power. It's taking that information, taking action on it, that allows you to create the power for you to grow up and create the life that you know you want and deserve. And Kevin shared so many different amazing pieces of advice with you about business, about life, about productivity. I mean, there's so many things that he covered that you can go out there and take immediate action on. And again, go out there and create the life that you know you want and deserve. So make sure that you're taking action. Also, I don't care where you're watching, listening to iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, wherever you're at, um, below will be all the links to uh, uh, Ritter's Warehouse, um, to uh, Kevin's book, all of that will be below. So make sure to check that out. Click on that right away. Thank you guys for watching and listening. And Kevin, man, I know how valuable your time is. This has been a hell of a lot of fun, dude. I truly appreciate you being here. All right, I appreciate it, Josh. Thanks so much. Yeah, you got it, my friend. All right, you guys, we will see you next time.